Everything from your sex life to troubles with your boss at work to your ability to trust and be open with your partner can be affected by abuse or trauma from your childhood. Now, the good news is that the challenges you face today don't have to be permanent. Today, I'm breaking down what childhood abuse includes. You'd be amazed by how many people I've worked with who don't even realize that what happened to them as a kid is actually some type of abuse or trauma. The way, the why, the how, all of it, that it's affecting your relationship now, and as always, some resources to get you the help you need. So stay tuned. Well, hi there. Welcome back to the podcast. I am your ever-loving host, Dr. Abby Metcalf. You know that already. <clears throat> Excuse the frogginess. I might be <laughs> coughing up along a few times during this. Uh, yeah, I, I went on a vacation and I got, you know, a little sick after uh, all the travel and excitement. I did see Lady Gaga, which was quite fabulous. I don't mind telling you. Anyway, uh, and I actually feel really good though, even though I don't sound it necessarily, because I just read a bunch of really lovely reviews that you left for me. Thank you. Um, I cannot adequately describe how nice it feels to read your reviews. I read every single one of them and um, I'd like more. Uh, well, you know, more, first of all, more feels good. I'm not going to lie. It's really nice to read them. And, but, and also as importantly, and the real reason I ask is because it helps our podcast get found more. So again, we're, we're, trying to spread the word of love, of the Abbey love, of people really changing their lives and their relationships and being happier. We're trying to get rid of bigotry and hate and unhappiness. Yes, that is what we're doing. And believe it or not, if you're looking for the one way you can help, it's by leaving a review, sharing the podcast with people. But so if you could rate it on Spotify, take that moment, leave the review. Or if you're watching me on YouTube, if you can like and subscribe, you know, all the things help get the word out. So, um, please do that. And thank you for the kind words. They really feel so good. They feel so good. And they let me know, you know, that I'm on track. So yeah, so keep that going. Now, <clears throat> I really want to give a disclaimer, which I don't normally do for today's topic. If you think this applies to you today, if you're listening right now because of you or someone that you really love, as opposed to, you know, I don't know, I think some people just like to learn and like to hear all about the different things. I know I have a lot of uh, psychology and uh, social work students who listen so uh, or therapists. So, you know, that's a little different. But if you're listening because of you or someone close to you, I do not want you to listen to this on the fly. I want you to shut this down right now. <laughs> Be, and let me just explain. I, there's a lot of information here and it, hearing it could trigger you in some way. So here's what I want. I want you, if this again applies, carve out some calm time when you are feeling relatively fresh. Make sure you're, you know, you're hydrated. Make sure you're fed. Take a moment, set an intention, check in with yourself before listening. That is what I would like. Please do that. Don't, this is too important to just, you know, oh, I listened for 10 minutes in the car and then I listened for 10 minutes here. And then I, that's not really, you know, this information is sort of bigger information. The other disclaimer I want to make is I'm not a trauma therapist. This is not my specialty. I have decades in the field. I have done, of course, you know, I've taken classes. I've done all the things. Yes, I've been around people. Yes. But I will tell you that in my private practice, I refer out. Yes, I do. If someone comes in with these issues that are more than we can deal with in a sort of way in the session, I refer them out for individual work, which I'll talk about at the very end because there's specific kinds of work that really help with, uh, you know, overcoming abuse and trauma. So uh, I do want to say that. And um, that's what I want to say. So I'm giving some disclaimers. How do you like that? I don't usually have disclaimers, but before we jump in. <clears throat> okay. So I don't know where else to start except with what qualifies as childhood abuse or trauma. And I got to tell you, this is usually problem number one. I have met with so many clients over the years who are struggling in their lives and their relationships, you know, now as adults, and they don't realize how much of it stems from things they experienced as kids. 
uh, they just didn't know that that was affecting them so strongly. So when I sit here and talk about childhood abuse or trauma, a lot of times people don't understand what is in there. So, you know, things like incest, uh, sexual abuse, physical violence, people get like, oh, that counts. You know, they, they see that. But what they don't often realize is that there's a lot of gray area in those terms even. So you might have been, for example, sexually abused. I've had this happen and not realize that that's what that was. Or you might have suffered from emotional neglect as a kid and didn't realize that what that was and didn't realize that it meant you'd still be dealing with it today. So I did, of course, do some other podcasts on trauma. You might, you know, you might have unhealed trauma and not know it. I think the one is called, I'll link to them, um, and uh, about the different, you know, that your people pleasing might be a trauma response. I did a couple others, but I've gotten so many Oh, so many emails and so many people asking questions that I didn't even want to do this as a doc, Dr. Abby, ask Dr. Abby, because it's just so, it's so big and I, I want to give you full love here. So, um, okay, so childhood trauma in the big picture, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Tr childhood trauma and abuse in, in any kind of big picture. So abuse is a trauma. Let's, let's just be real. I might just be saying trauma sometimes and I'm talking about abuse, of course, is traumatic. Um, so childhood trauma really refers to any, any significantly distressing experiences you had as a kid. I know. That's a lot. That covers a whole lot of ground, right? So again, like uh, physical violence, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. And let me just say this. I've noticed like sexual abuse can cover a lot of ground also. So inappropriate fondling right? That's sexual abuse. Um, any kind of, and obviously sex itself or any kind of sexual act, but also boundary violations. Uh, I've had clients who had uh, a, an adult getting naked in front of them with an erection or not being able to lock the bathroom door. You couldn't use it alone. I've had, you know, people who, you know, were 13 and had brothers or dads or even mom sometimes you know people coming in the bathroom and watching them shower or go to the bathroom things like that it gets really gray because again you might have had a home where that was you know there was nothing untoward about it where that was something that was very sort of part of the family culture you know to kind of be naked and hang out but there's a feeling associated with it and by the way you might have had siblings that were fine with it and you're not that's the deal. That's why this is can be so hard. And again, it doesn't mean that someone meant something terrible. It could have been their own poor boundaries. Um, there was sexual abuse in my own mother's life. So her boundaries around sex were sometimes distorted and a little funky. Uh, you know, there had been incest and rape and all kinds of horrible things in her childhood and her background. So it would come across in weird ways, but she never inappropriately touched me like that like that was not a thing yet that sort of stuff can come down and you can see things and go that's weird that doesn't feel right that feels icky and so <clears throat> just be just be aware um other things that qual qualify as you know abuse or trauma definitely you know natural disasters you might have lost your house in a fire when you were very young or something like that that's really traumatic um been involved in a horrible car accident, earthquake, whatever. Uh, obviously, people come from other countries where there's war and other things. Uh, loss, loss of someone you loved could be a friend. A fr you know, I've had clients whose friend, you know, when they were young, a friend committed suicide or died suddenly. Um, I worked with a woman who was traumatized by her best friend and next door neighbor when he was, uh, I think they were eight years old, and he had gone to the dentist and he died at the dentist from the some he had some reaction to the novocaine or being put under or something and it was traumatic for her so again that's a one-time event it could be ongoing events like abandonment neglect uh, neglect's a big one I just was working with a client recently who didn't even realize that the emotional neglect he suffered he was fed he was, you know, there was food in the house, there was a roof over his head, but there was a ton of emotional neglect. He had nowhere to go with things. And he didn't even realize that he was neglected or that that traumatized him. 
Uh, and in our couple's work, he's really been sort of realizing a lot of this. I, I'm thinking of another woman right now, the exact same situation as him. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So it's really any event where you felt or the person you love felt scared, uh, helpless, horrified, overwhelmed, again, in such a way. So, and that's again why this can be so hard. Ob there's again, more obvious things where people had abuse over time or neglect over time or something over time. And there's other things that could have been like a one shot deal. So, you know, because we all experience life in different ways, what as I've said before, might be traumatic for you, may not be traumatic for someone else. What really matters is how you perceive the situation and how you feel. And of course, there's also what we call complex trauma, which is this repeated exposure to the distressing bad events or experiences over a period of time. And you can imagine how pervasive that is, like a complex trauma. So there's layers to this. Again, it's, it's why we are doing the kind of top brush strokes to really give you this information in a hopefully a way that you can really listen to and understand and hear and then you go and deal with it and deal with what you need to deal with so <clears throat> and at the very least talk to a talk to your therapist about it or a friend or somebody if any of this is hitting you even and I've had that quite a bit I've had people email me after um, podcast episodes like this and say I didn't even realize that was a thing you know my my brother I I had someone email me her brother was like jacking off in front of her um, they were both young teenagers it happened once but he was like looking at her you know it just it doesn't matter that it happened once and she kept you know boys will be boys and she was always and he was a you know good brother to her he didn't touch her at any other time nothing else and that's sometimes the bigger problem when it's there's not an obvious you know bad terrible person where but it didn't it still affected her greatly and it still was traumatic so all right let's do i'm going to do some quick facts not a ton right now but just some to keep you understanding so men and women suffer similarly as adults from childhood abuse we know this from the research oh and, and you know abbymedcalf.com forward slash podcast or go to the blog you know you know I'm gonna have all the links all the articles all the things there okay for you so I'm not gonna keep saying it <clears throat> over and over where I got things from but you know me I'm the research queen so if I'm saying something it's it's been researched and uh quote unquote proven to a greater a great extent uh we know that at least one in four women and one in six men in the United States were sexually abused as children. That's such a crazy number. In the U.S., more than two-thirds of children have experienced some form of trauma. Think of that. More than two-thirds of children have experienced some form of trauma. So you can hear how different that could be. And of course, because I have listeners across the globe, uh, uh, there was a study in The Lancet, I think it was. But, and again, that'll be linked. But one in eight adults have reported childhood sexual abuse and one in four have reported physical abuse across the globe. That's that those are more global numbers. So depending on where you're listening, you know, could be more or less than that, but <clears throat> those are your ballparks. Now, so it's pervasive. It's huge. It's not as rare as you as you might think. And it's getting reported more and more, which is wonderful uh, that it's getting reported, but of course, yeah, we're we're hearing about it more and more and that's why. So you know, you're listening right now because you want to know, so why does it affect my adult relationships? Okay, this thing happened as a kid. I get that. Why am I still affected now? And why am I even affected if I didn't even know I, something like that? Like if I'm just realizing now that it was abuse, uh, well, you can see why, right? You you know, subconsciously things were happening. But, and I, I again, I want to say this is an extremely complex complex issues so there's there are many many reasons abuse and trauma can affect your adult relationships but I want to talk about four main ones okay four I want to talk about <clears throat> one the reason number one is attachment styles we form our attachment styles in childhood which again the research shows clearly absolutely 
creates the ways we attach in our adult relationships. And I did a whole fabulous, amazing, incredible uh, podcast episode on this on, uh, I think it's called How Attached to you, Are You to Your Partner? If you just want to search for that on your platform or on my website. Uh, I did that a while ago and we talk about the different attachment styles. And again, I don't like to repeat things that you can find easily somewhere else. And that is a topic that was so big. It has its own home, its own life on my website and, and on the, you know, wherever you download podcasts. So um, I do want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I do want to say briefly that the way we attach, you know, basically there's secure attachment who, those are the people that, you know, are are healthiest in relationships and then there are insecure attachment styles and the two biggies are being anxiously attached or avoidantly attached and you can imagine that if you um depending on the kind of trauma you had as a kid that of course how attached you feel to your caregivers how much you feel like they have your best interests at heart they're taking care of you they're listening to you it, that obviously so that's getting all molded and then that is going to affect you later because that becomes the way you attach to a partner that you either um, become very anxious and needy and clingy or you become very, very avoidant you don't need anybody it's easy to come in and out of relationships you don't you have a lot of trouble with emotional intimacy right so it, it, that that's the, I think the number one way it gets affected and again you can listen all about that separately if you think this applies to you. The second reason are communication styles. And I am going to, I think, do another episode just on communication styles. So again, I won't spend a ton of time here. I have done one before, but there's some different ones I'd like to do um, because there's so many kinds of childhood communication styles and childhood trauma and abuse can also absolutely affect the way you communicate as an adult. <laughs> because think about it, you figured out how to communicate as a kid, right? This was modeled by the caregivers in your life, how you communicate about things. And that, you figured that out. You, you got trained, for lack of a better term, and that's how you communicate as an adult. So, and I will give an example. I, I think the most common I can think of is maybe as a kid, you grew up in a home where anytime there was a conversation or anytime there was a disagreement, it devolved into a yelling match. You know, that's what happened. <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't get through a day without some folks screaming at each other. So you might do the exact same thing with your partner or friends now, right? Uh, you, that might ha you might notice yourself getting into fights a lot, maybe consciously, maybe unconsciously. You know, you learn to think that the way to deal with conflict is to yell about it. Or I've had people say to me, well, the only time anyone listens is when I'm yelling. <clears throat> you know, that's the only way I get heard. And of course, that's not true. Of course, it feels that way. I know. But um, or you could, by the way, be on the opposite side of that spectrum. Right. So you might um, you might find it hard to express your emotions or talk about your feelings at all. Uh, you might never talk about what's important to you because, again, of the communication that was in your house, how people spoke to each other and what you saw what you modeled. So you might have, again, modeled what you saw, or you might model the opposite. Uh, you, you, that might be how you think about it. So, and again, there are a lot of communication styles. And the more I'm talking here, the more I realize I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a podcast on it. <laughs> but I'll, I'll talk about, I want to talk about three broad categories right now. So that seem to come out of our childhood. And these are the three main ones I see. Again, there's many more and I'll, I'll go into it more in depth in, in a future episode. But um, passive, there's passive. And usually with a passive communication style, there's a lot of what we call triangulation. So in my house, you know, because uh, I'm an avoider, I, if I wanted my mother to know something, I would tell my sister. And that way <laughs> I knew my mother would find out without me having to, God forbid, talk my feelings directly to this person. So you might in communicate indirectly. You might do that at work. You might do that with, you know, some work gossip person. And you know, if you say this thing, it'll get back to where you want it to get back to. Even later, if you deny that you wanted it to get back, but the fact that you spoke to this person that you know is always gossiping, come on. Obviously, you wanted it somewhere to get back. Um, or passive can also be denying you even have a feeling. Uh, you know, yourself, not denying like, um, you know, you feel angry and you tell someone, oh, I don't feel anything, but actually not realizing you even have a feeling, not, not even knowing. Uh, 
again, this was me a lot. Uh, the, I didn't even know I had feelings till I first time I went to rehab and <clears throat> they went around asking for feelings. I was like, feelings. Um, it could be apologizing a lot. I, I'm, I'm working on that in my own life now, not apologizing all the time, you know, for feeling the way I do, or, uh, you might've just apologized for anything you said or felt. Um, that's a lot of how passive communication style shows up. Then of course there's passive aggressive and we hear about this one a lot. This is when you, you appear passive and non-emotional. You could even appear happy about something, but then act out your anger or resentment indirectly behind the scenes or in some difficult, subtle way that's difficult to pinpoint, you know? So you're, you know, you're the dig maybe or the sarcasm or actually doing something mean later, you know, uh, that isn't very nice or whatever. Um, uh, you know, forgetting something. I see that sometimes that's very passive aggressive. You know, you'll say you're mad at your, you're mad at your wife. You say you'll pick up the dry cleaning on the way home and then you somehow forgot. Um, you know, I, I can always, I always see that. I see when that stuff happens <clears throat> quite a bit. Excuse me again. I'm going to have a sip of water. Okay. Um, and then of course there's aggressive. We all know what aggressive looks like. This is, you know, directly attacking blaming, criticizing. Uh, and sometimes aggressive is having a real, like a, like an outsized response that doesn't fit the situation. So, you know, you, you might be just having kind of a, what you think is a, a, a throwaway conversation and all of a sudden, you know, things spin out of control <laughs> and, and this person's yelling at you or, vi or you're yelling at them. Um, that is an aggressive, right? That's aggressive. Okay. So, Attachment styles, communication styles, those are reasons. Reason number three, and this is a biggie, and it's actually, I have four reasons here, but three and four are very uh, connected. <clears throat> and this is because it's affecting your adult relationships because there are physical changes in your brain that you don't even realize. So there's a lot of attention, you know, when we talk about this stuff that's directed at the, of course, the psychological changes that happen when there's been childhood abuse or trauma. Of course, someone is aggressive or passive aggressive or shy or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, all the things. There's lots of stuff or they're, you know, upset or whatever. But it's really equally important to understand that there are physical changes too. There are physical changes too. And I'm going to talk briefly about some specific changes that are affecting your thoughts and reaction when there's been childhood trauma or abuse. So let me just, I'm going to do a brief, I promise. I know I, I don't want to get too deep in the science, but I, I want you to hear this piece. So I'm thinking how to do this quickly. Okay. So, so I've talked about your, your autonomic nervous system before, right? And that basically your, your ANS, your autonomic nervous system, that's your automatic one. It, it's the one that basically regulates all of your involuntary processes. So the things you don't have to think about your body doing that just sort that just automatically happen, you know, your heart rate, your blood pressure, digestion, blinking your eyes, salivating, right? All the things you, you do not have to think about. Okay. <clears throat> so within that automatic structure, and I've talked about this before, and we talk about the lizard brain and other things, but I'm going to go a different way. So stick with me. So within that, we have two main branches. There's actually a third branch, but we're not going there today. We have two main branches, okay, in your autonomic nervous system, in your ANS, and that's your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. So your sympathetic is, I want you to think of that a little differently today when we talk about it. This is your body, your brain, or your body's accelerator. And your parasympathetic nervous system, your parasympathetic, is the brakes, Okay, so your sympathetic nervous system. So here's your, your automatic stuff happens and this auto, these two automatic routes that things can go down the one road is this, uh, your sympathetic nervous system is responsible for your arousal, right? This is like your fight or flight response to things, okay? So your sympathetic, it, it moves the blood to your muscles for quick action. It, it puts out adrenaline. It speeds up your heart, increases your blood pressure. All the things you're going to need to fight or flee, <laughs> okay? Think about that, right? Again, the tiger, it's coming to eat me, right? 
Boom. So all this stuff happens. And again, I don't have to think about it. It happens automatically. Okay. And that, so that's like the accelerator. I'm going to run away or I'm going to stand here and fight. And I need all this energy and focus and, and all this stuff. Okay. Or there's this other pathway called your parasympathetic nervous system. And this one is all about really self-preservation. Remember, this is your breaks. And this is what's focusing on your digestion. We call it the rest and digest mode. It's your healing, all that, okay? Uh, We also think of it as attend and befriend when we, it's when we're, you know, doing social things and making things okay with each other. So, but mostly your parasympathetic focuses on digestion and healing, okay? And it triggers the release of Uh, acetylcholine really, which is what puts on the brakes of all that arousal. Okay. So, you know, you're fighting, you're fleeing, all this stuff. So then then we need something that's going to slow it all down, to slow your heart rate, to relax your muscles, to return to normal breathing, right? You you need something that's going to help you do that. And that's, that's how these two work in tandem. Now, and, and I want you to experience them right now. This is really important. So stick with me. This is really, right here is going to help you. You you don't have to listen to the rest of the podcast. (laughs) Right here is going to help you. Right now, if you take a deep breath in, deep breath in, when you do that, you're actually activating your sympathetic nervous system. Athletes, they often take a few deep breaths right before starting a competition because that deep breath will give you a burst of that adrenaline, acetylcholine. It'll speed up your heart. It'll get you pumped. Okay. (gasps) You know, (gasps) okay. Right. That's how it does it. Now, but If you, a long, slow exhale, as you slowly exhale that deep breath you just took in, right now you're going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. (laughs) I hope you weren't holding your breath all that time. Sorry. Uh, You're going to, so you breathe it in, you activate your sympathetic, everything's aroused, boop, boop, boop. And then that long, slow breath out. Now I'm activating my parasympathetic nervous system, which slows my heart down. So long, slow breaths out help calm you down. So always pay attention to your exhale when you want to ground or calm yourself. So it's one of the, it's a small mistake, but I see it a lot where people say, oh, just, you know, take a deep breath if you're upset. Um, No, don't take a deep breath. (laughs) Think about it. If you're upset, you take a deep breath, you're more upset. It's like, (gasps) you know, that's what we do when we're upset. We do take a deep breath. That's kind of part of the problem. It, It creates some of that excitement and fear in the brain. But when we, if you can focus on the exhale and maybe even counting to eight or even 10 as you exhale long and slow, that's what's going to help ground you and calm you. So there you go, right there, done. Price of admission. How do you like that? Okay. The other thing I want to say about this is our brains are built to belong. That, That is how our brains function. Our brains are built to help us function as members of a clan or a tribe. And we're part of that clan or tribe, even when we're alone, right? You you might be listening to music. You're alone, all alone, but somebody else created the music usually, right? Or maybe you're watching your favorite baseball team in t- team on TV. And do you ever watch and you're I'm watching the Mets? They're doing really well right now. Whenever you listen to this, they might not be, but they have been. Uh, you ever have your muscles tense when you're watching, or or you if I'm watching my kid, you know throw a ball or run or something when my kids, you know, your muscles are tensing as you see someone run to first base or do whatever. That is that belonging. That is that, you know, mirror neurons. That is all that good stuff. Uh, you're preparing a presentation for a meeting at work the next day, right? You're anticipating how they're going to react. What's going to happen? I wrote up this podcast. I was thinking, how's this going to sound? Oh, I should add this here. How's that going to be? That's what we're doing. Most of our energy is devoted to connecting to other people in some way. Again, even when we're alone, but so much of it is devoted to that. And I want to say this, being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. I'm going to say that again. Feeling safe, doesn't have to be a ton of people, but with some people, is a huge, huge, huge aspect of having good mental health. Safe connections for us as humans are, they're fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. I've done, you know, episodes on this too, about, you know, relationships, how important they are. It's why I do the podcast. (laughs) So 
it's big. Now, and I, I want to just throw this in right here. It's not just being seen by others that makes us feel safe. That's why if you stay, spend all day on you know, social media with everybody liking your stuff, you're not going to feel safe. That, do, that doesn't make you feel safe. It's a little quick hit, but you keep needing more hits because we need reciprocity to feel safe with others. We need to feel reciprocity. So you feel, if, you have a, if you have a dog, if you have a golden retriever, you have reciprocity in your life. <laughs> there, that dog's out the door. You know, with the, with the butt wag, you know, the butt move. You know, they're so excited, so excited, anticipation. They're coming home, they're coming home, you're coming up the walk. Oh my God, you're almost in the house, you're here. There is such reciprocity with how you feel and how they feel. It's a really wonderful thing. So it doesn't have to just be from people. That's why pets uh, improve our mental health and all the good things. But I do. it feels so good. It's real. It's real. So, so I do want to say that. And we'll talk a little more as we go. But so when you've experienced abuse or trauma in your childhood, really my point of all this is that your nervous system is changed. Your nervous system has an altered perception of risk and safety. I like that. I know. The physical, your brain is physically changed. How things happen in your brain are physically changed. So, but that, and so if you're just focusing with trauma on, you know, psychological things without any kind of physical, uh, speaking to the physical issues, that's why a lot of it doesn't go well. And that's why for some people they've tried talk therapy and it hasn't worked. So again, I'm going to give some alternatives at the very end and some, I'll have some links on the website for you, but, um, you really have to keep that in mind. So, and there's a really famous trauma researcher, Stephen, I think I would say his name wrong. I apologize, Stephen Porges, P-O-R-J-E-G-E-S, sorry, P-O-R-G-E-S. Um, but he coined this term, neuroception. And it's to describe this, our capacity to evaluate relative danger and safety in our environments. So by relative, right? So if a, if a, if I'm walking by a house and a dog starts barking, I'm going to, this neuroception, right? I'm going to look, is the dog inside? Is there a big gate? What, what's my, what's the relative danger? Is it, is it immediate? Is it acute? Is it far away? You, you have this little way our brains work to see, is this something to be worried about or not? And, but that gets altered, as I just said, when we've had childhood abuse or trauma. So to get well, you, you not only, you, you, you have to train your brain to respond appropriately to danger. You not only have to do that, but you also need to teach it to experience safety, how to really be relaxed, and true this reciprocity in your relationships, okay? So it's, so I'm giving you all this because I'm trying, and I hope I said that all well, I'm trying to have you see that there's, there's a way these all go together. So sometimes people just try to deal with the one side and not the other. You, you need both. And that's why we have um, really good trauma therapy that does both these days. But you, you can't just focus on, um, you know, uh, responding well to danger, you know. Oh, okay. So this isn't so dangerous. Don't worry. Okay. Oh, when my mother says that she doesn't like my hair, you know, if my boss says I'd like to see you in my office in 10 minutes or whatever, right? These danger responses that we might have an, an outsized response to, these danger, sorry, scenarios that we might have an outsized response to, when that, that's one thing to get better at, to realize that, okay, calm down. We don't have to freak out about this, right? All that good stuff. And, but we also need to really be teaching our brains to get familiar with these feelings of safety, relaxation, and again, what true reciprocity and relationship looks like. So it's really always a, a two-pronged uh, approach. <clears throat> and there's a lot of things that happen, you know, again, Por Porgia, Porgia's, uh, he writes that when, that when we feel threatened, so there are basically three responses we have when we first feel threatened. And think of this as a kid. So you, you feel threatened as a kid. Something bad is going on. So the first thing we do is we call out for help or support or comfort from the people around us, okay? So you can imagine if I'm a kid and I'm getting hurt by the person who's supposed to be giving me support or comfort, can you see the problem here? 
uh, you know, no one's listening. No, or maybe I got bullied at school and I come home and my and my my dad or whoever says to suck it up. I'm not getting support or comfort from the people around me. Okay. When that doesn't work, when we we so we first we try to get help. We try to we we do try to do that. If that doesn't work, we our fight or flight response takes over. Okay, so we either now I'm going to fight the bully or I'm going to find a way around the bully and I'm not going to tell anybody about it. Okay, and again, you might say, hey, I was bullied at school and I never even I never even tried to tell my parents. It's because of something you had already learned that you thought it wasn't safe to go tell your parents. I just want to say that. So you learned it at some point that these are not your people for safety and comfort for whatever reason. I'm not saying that you learned it because it was true. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that's what happened. And so that's why later with something you reacted the way you did. Okay, so that's support and comfort we're looking for. If we can't get that, we're going to stay and fight or we're going to run away. And if we can't fight or run away, if we can't get away or we feel trapped in some way, we'll shut down and try to expend as little energy as possible. And, you know, that's that freeze response, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. That's how that happens. And if you've ever seen, it's a horrible thing to watch, but, you know, a zebra getting taken down by a tiger or a lion or something, you'll see that if they can't get away, it sometimes will look bizarre because they'll be getting eaten alive and they're just calmly sitting there. And that's because, again, this wonderful, so it's, it's, it's nature's way of helping us not go crazy and not be in terror. And so, but what happens when that starts to happen over and over time, that could have happened to you that you don't even know, notice danger anymore, or you don't even try to get away anymore. You, you know, this is this learned helplessness and over time. So these are all kind of, obviously, as you can imagine, pretty scary places to get stuck. Okay. So again, we'll come back to that. Reason number four, which is really connected to this with all these physical changes that, you know, this is affecting your adult relationships. So you can see, right, how everything I'm saying, you know, how you communicate affects your adult relationships, how you bond connects your, <laughs> affects your adult relationships, how you're reacting to things, right, in these moments is affecting your adult relationships. And hyperarousal is another piece of this that I often see um, in uh, people who have had ongoing trauma. And it's, it's, it's another physical change, right? And it causes, but it causes behavioral changes that will affect your relationships. And so hyperarousal is basically, it's, it's a, I want to say it well, it's an abnormally heightened state of anxiety. How's that? You're, you're in a, 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 yeah, an abnormal heightened state of anxiety kind of all the time or way too often over again, something that doesn't quite match. So, and obviously now, like even though the childhood threat is no longer a thing, now that you're an adult, your body responds physically as if it's still happening. When you are triggered, we call, right, triggering, uh, when you're triggered in some way or have uh, something in your current situation feel like it did as a kid, okay? So you are hyper aroused and I'm, I'm not going to get into an entire episode on PTSD and don't write in I don't think I'm going <laughs> to if you write in enough if you want an episode on that I'll do it but again there's others who do it better than me and this is their specialty but I'm going to say this uh for post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD again post after the traumatic stress there's this disordered symptoms and hyper arousal is definitely a symptom of PTSD and basically you know the body's having some kind of overreaction to the stress response, that's what's happening. It, PTSD causes biological changes in the brain. And there's this, um, again, like dysregulation of your stress response system. It doesn't, it, it's broke. It broke. It doesn't work well. It's not completely broken. It's not like it's not there, but it's not working the way it, it quote unquote should. And it could be triggered by just remembering something, right? Remembering an event. But it can also be, again, triggered in the, in the current by something that your brain is remembering that this reminds it of something from your childhood. So I know, I know it's a lot. So, and hyper arousal looks like a lot of things, right? And, and it can affect children too, by the way. So it's not, 
it's not like everything I'm describing doesn't happen to kids in their moments, but definitely these are the symptoms that happen in adulthood too, or at least. So what we see are things like chronic anxiety. Uh, in adults, definitely this crazy controlling behavior and, and kids too, but we're talking about adults right now. Uh, really overtly controlling, like you can't let go of anything. Difficulty concentrating, um, irritability, angry outbursts are common. This hypervigilance, there's another way, hyperarousal, hypervigilance, you know, being on guard all the time, seeing the slightest slight, something terrible, you know, oh, he meant that when he said, you know, really going after things. Um, just this like vigilance, this readiness, that's part of this kind of hyperarousal. The arousal, though, is a very physical response. The vigilance is a kind of behavioral response, right? That you're always on guard, always watching for things. That amygdala is always lit up. So I know, I know. So as you're listening, you might think, oh, wow, this is really me, or wow, this is really my partner or my sister or whoever, right? Okay. Now, childhood abuse and trauma affects your adult relationships in all these ways, right? This is all this, these ways that, that things are getting affected. Um, I'm on to see how I said this right. <laughs> because you got to think about it. The trauma and emotion and abuse are, are in childhood are, are going to affect your emotional development, right? They're going to affect your emotional development and how you relate to people and how you communicate and how you bond and what happens in your brain and your these physical changes and how much you look for danger and all those things. And so the ways that it most commonly shows up in adult in, in a partnership, let's say, of some kind, the number one hands down biggest way I see it show up is trust. Um, if you or this person you love is is trust just never seems to be something they can get a grip on. Um, you know, let's face it, childhood abuse and trauma, they come to the very core of how we trust the world, our, our, how we trust our caregivers, how we trust ourselves. So this is just the biggest impact area. And I've done a lot of episodes on trust. I'm going to do some more in the future on trust and how to build trust in relationships. Um, again, I don't want to spend a ton of time here, but just that's the when I'm working with someone um, individually or in a couple and their trust is like just so kind of broken, you know, just so not there. Again, it could show up as jealousy sometimes or just, or even never trusting their own opinion about anything, you know, not trusting themselves ever. I, I, I'm often looking for some kind of trauma that maybe isn't uncovered or we haven't looked at or something like that. So trust is the biggest area I think I see. And closely on the heels of that, I don't even know if I can count this as a second a second area, but uh, intimacy, um, emotional closeness, and that's what and I I mean by intimacy, and of course it's related to trust, right? It's also related to what you learned as a child is acceptable, is expected, or even possible when it comes to true emotional closeness. What do you? Um, and again, I'm talking about emotional closeness when I talk about this kind of emotional intimacy, this, this, um, what did you see? What did you experience? What do you think is, can happen? Um, all of this, when there's been trauma in childhood or in any, in any of these ways, often our ability as adults to be truly vulnerable, trust open and really because you need those things to really be emotionally close are, are absent and so often I'll hear people say something about their partner like they're just not all the way there or um you know I'm, I, I, I just asked them to share their feelings and they're acting like you know whatever it, and again it, it's it's really hard it's really hard for them so that's the other big way I see it showing up Definitely in sex life, that's a third way I would say is really common. Again, I, I want to separate that out from emotional um, intimacy. And that could be because there was sex, sexual abuse as a child. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of confusion regarding power dynamics, you know, asserting your needs and all that. Um, but even if you weren't sexually abused as a kid uh, in any way, you can absolutely have your sex life affected because, again, it's a very vulnerable thing. You're not sure how to say what you want. 
Um, you, again, you don't have that trust built up, not knowing how to be emotionally close. So yeah, your sex life can absolutely be affected. Either wanting it more or not wanting it at all. That happens. I don't want you to think that someone who wants sex all the time, that that's healthy or, or that someone who doesn't want sex is unhealthy. It's not that way. It's, it's a continuum, right? It's always about the why. Where is this from? Why do I want sex right now? What am I looking for? All those good things. Sex is wonderful and great and I'm, I'm down and it, it, it's just about, it's much like, you know, uh, I talk about with alcohol. It's not really how much you drink. It's why you drink. Uh, and it's the same way with sex. It's not that you want five times a week or twice a week or 10 times, whatever. It's about the why. Where is it being driven from? What, what's it about for you? Uh, and then another area that I see really, really affected is the ability to convey your feelings and needs. I see this so much. So Many people who've survived some kind of child, again, childhood trauma or abuse, they have an issue with something, and I hope I say this right, it's, it's called uh, alexithymia. Pretty sure I have that right. I'll have it on the podcast, but yeah, alexithymia. Um, and it, which is basically, that's a, that's a psych, psychological word for not having words for feelings. That's what alexithymia is. You, when pe and people develop this, it's like a condition where you just can't quite have a word for how you're feeling. You don't even know how to describe it. Uh, you can't describe a feeling in a given moment. You, when someone asks how you feel, you're just like, I don't know what you're talking about. You're so sort of distanced from it. Um, and again, that could come from sexual abuse in childhood where, or any kind of physical abuse where you're not in charge of your body, obviously. So you, you get out of touch with how you feel or are supposed to feel um, physically. So that also happens mentally. Or any kind of, you know, emotional abuse, uh, it, gaslighting, anything where you, you know, you had a feeling and you were told not to feel that way or it wasn't appropriate or, you know, you were wrong or any of those things. You, understanding our feelings is a skill. And so if you had no uh, history of building that skill, guess what? You're having trouble. Um, what I found a lot with people with alexithymia is they often... They'll like sometimes they'll I'll be in session with them and they seem really mad at me and you know I've said something I don't like and I'll say hey let's talk about you know what's going on right now and you you know you seem angry or whatever and they're like I'm fine and they mean it they're not just denying they really mean it they feel fine it's like things don't match up the other thing I see is that they're often very busy doing right because they don't have the words or emotions so it's like action is substituted instead uh, I see that a lot too. So, and there can be a lot of other signs of, you know, trauma and childhood abuse, but those are the ways that I see it the most showing up in adult relationships. Those are the biggies I see over and over. And again, just because you have trouble identifying a feeling doesn't mean you have trauma you couldn't figure out or something necessarily. So it's just, this is all about opening a door, having you maybe, you know, get that first blush of something maybe you hadn't really uh, investigated before and really understood before. What I'm trying to give you today is a lot, is a kind of a broad brush stroke of understanding, which hopefully I, I did. So really the work is in getting the help that's needed. And it's not a podcast. <laughs> okay it's too big it ain't a podcast I'm not saying this can't be helpful today and something on the road to recovery this is very you know doing a little light version here but I I have to highly recommend if any if you identified with anything in today's podcast if anything felt now I know you might be sitting there going oh well that doesn't apply that doesn't apply that doesn't apply but if things feel if there's a few things I said that you almost felt embarrassed or like Oh yeah, like you, maybe you felt your stomach drop out, a lot of things. Maybe you had some physical reaction to it. Guess what? I want to highly recommend some kind of therapy. <laughs> highly. Did I mention highly? I do the podcast. I started the podcast as a means for people to have access to great information to improve their lives and relationships and without needing to go to therapy. Because I know therapy is not accessible to everyone listening. You, you can't get to a therapist. I, I get that. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm doing this, this here. 
And I can't be everything to everyone and I'm not going to try to be. That would be so unethical. And so I don't want to hurt you. I love you. And if you're listening, this is a lot. And so I'm telling you, I'd like you to figure out something. So I'm going to give you a lot of different options right now. We're going to, and again, all the links are on the website. Okay. So because there's a lot of roads to Rome. And I want to recommend that you work with someone, first of all, who's trained in trauma. There are different types of therapy that are used for people recovering from childhood abuse and trauma that are that are way more effective, that have been studied. We know this. So you that's where you want to look first. If you have any means, so I'm talking to you people first who have any kind of means, you can locate a therapist who specializes in trauma. There's an International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. Um, they have like a find a clinician tool. I'm going to link to it on the site, or you can just go where I just said and look it up yourself and Google it. There'll be a find a clinician tool on the website. That would be first and foremost, because it's a good place to start. And even if you're not sure if this is the problem, trust me, you know, you go to see this person who's specialized, they'll be able to tell you, oh, you know what? This is really not all this. It's that, you know, they'll be able to help you. That's kind of, I think, where you'd want to start if you can. If you can, there's also um, a, a clinically proven technique that I refer my clients to all the time called EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And it is an incredible evidence-based tool for dealing with trauma. It's, you know, their goal is, it. the goal of EMDR is basically to use eye movement to redirect you from these traumatic memories that you might be having, uh, you know, of, from the past to current sensations of what you're feeling in the present and to literally rewire the brain around that. And they do resource work, which remember I talked earlier about needing the two things, the safety and the dealing with the responses you're having. You know, EMDR does that beautifully. The protocols, I would tell you to go to someone very experienced. Don't go to someone who's brand new at it. I love you brand new people. But, you know, I find that sometimes people kind of overstep. They learn like this new tool and they feel like, oh, I have this thing, this shiny new object. And um, not all therapists do that. I know a lot of really, really good therapists who have trained themselves in EMDR to use it in their practice, even though trauma isn't their specialty. So again, that's great. I just, I want you to be mindful. I don't want there to be another trauma with, uh, it's going to be hard enough to get therapy and to put yourself out there if you haven't yet. So I really want you to spend some time making sure that there's a good connection, good experience of this person, ask them questions, really make sure this is your person. I've done EMDR myself um, because I refer to it so much. Anything I refer to a lot, I tend to also um, go do to see what it's like. And uh, it's incredible. And, and it's, again, very, it's kind of like, it's regular kind of talk therapy, but you're either wearing headphones with this bilateral sound going back and forth, or they use um, a light that goes back and forth. And you, often you're holding something in your hands, which have a bilateral kind of uh, vibration, uh, meaning back and forth between the two sides of your body. And again, it's this way, it's, it's incredible. The army uses this. This is not like new age stuff. This is true, wonderful, effective treatment. Um, there is something newer called brain spotting, which has been around less time, which is similar to EMDR. And uh, there's not as much research on it yet, so I don't, you know, it's fine if you're doing brain spotting and you have somebody really good who's certified. I uh, just, I don't know as much about it. I do have some people I know who I respect greatly who do it, um, who are pract practitioners. Um, it's just not something I generally refer to because I, I, again, I'd like there to be a few more years of research. So uh, having said that, I also have referred to as an adjunct to biofeedback or neurofeedback. Again, great research on this as a grounding tool, um, but I don't find it to be a substitute for actual therapy therapy. I think it's an adjunct tool. I do, I do want to say that. Um, there are certain types of cognitive behavioral therapy, what we call CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, that are really, again, evidence-based approaches to being um, really effective with trauma. 
particularly there's imagery rescripting, um, things like that. There's some very specific uh, things they can do to help with that trauma reactivity and racing thoughts and that kind of thing. So uh, that can be really helpful to find someone who specializes there. You know, mindfulness can also be very beneficial since it helps you, you think about it, you're focusing your attention in a non-judgmental way on what you're feeling. So you're noticing your feeling, you know, what you're feeling emotionally, what you're feeling physically in a moment, instead of allowing, you know, the, the monkey mind to, to take over and be erratic or, you know, have all these stressful thoughts and craziness. And, but I, again, I would say that, and mindfulness to me, again, is an adjunct. It's, it, I don't, I, I wouldn't really recommend you doing only mindfulness and not doing some other kind of, of actual therapy with a trained person, if possible. Uh, if you have no other access to anything else, the issue with mindfulness can be that it can be overwhelming for people who have had trauma and abuse in their past that actually sitting like that and trying to meditate or be mindful can, could be detrimental. So it, you can kind of imagine that, right? So again, I'd like there to be some container that that's in, some some way that you're utilizing that within something greater. That would be my preference that that gets figured out. Um, there's people have written to me asking about what about medication? And yeah, medications can be great and really helpful. Uh, but again, you wouldn't do medication alone. And that's for anything. That's for depression. That's for anxiety. That's for anything that you might take a psychotropic uh, medication for. It, they are, you know, more, much more effective when utilized with therapy. So you, you want to think of it that way. I wouldn't have medication be a first thing I did. I would start with someone um, to work with and then have them work with a psychiatrist and you so that everybody can be on the same page and everybody can be talking. Some psychiatrists do, do, do conduct um, therapy, but th I want to say the vast majority do not. And let me just, so let me say this for people who don't know, because you might be listening going, what is, what is she talking about? So when we go to school, <laughs> there are different levels of schooling. So there's, there's a, you know, you might get like a bachelor's in psychology. That doesn't really give you much. You know, that's a very broad thing. And that's really getting you ready for another level. So there's a, there's master's degrees in most countries. They are something like a master's in social work or a master's in something like family therapy, something like that. Um, and those degrees are more specialized and people can, you know, that's like a, and then if that therapist then gets trauma training separately, like as a spec, kind of like a doctor who specializes in something, right? Uh, then that's great. And that's who I'm talking about as far as being with a specialist. Then there are psychologists like me. That's someone who's just been in school longer. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and we, you know, do on the other side, we do uh, research and we're, we're usually, it's, it's much more research directed. But have, in, initially, that's, that's part of getting your degree. It's more schooling. It's this research, big research project we call a dissertation where you have to, you know, bring something to the field that's new. Um, it's a whole different thing. And, but it, the people that are attracted to that are often different than are attracted to a master's. And I want to be clear that neither is better. What's better is someone who specializes in what you need. That's what's better. So I know sometimes people are like, oh, I want to see Abby because she's a doctor. It's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not saying I don't have a lot of good schooling and all that stuff, but I am saying that I certainly, I wouldn't take me over someone who's got a master's who specialized in trauma. I would choose them every day of the week. They're going to be better than me. So really be clear. It's the same thing with like drug and alcohol work. You know, seeing someone who's a psychologist, which is that PhD level, isn't any better than seeing someone who's a master's level if they don't specialize in drug and alcohol. You know, again, you want someone who specializes, who has a lot of experience in what you're going for. Okay. And then at the top of the heap, you could say, I think of it as a different heap, are psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are basically medical doctors. They go to, med they well, not basically, they are medical doctors. They go to school 
as a regular medical doctor. They go, you know, they take apart cadavers. They learn all about the body. They go on hospital rotations. They do all the same things. The difference is they specialize. So when MDs, you know, go through schooling, they generally specialize somewhere, right? You, you could have a just a primary care physician or general physician, right? But you also could go to see a cardiologist or a or a dermatologist or an ophthalmologist or right someone who specializes in a different area and a psychiatrist specialized in psychiatry in in psychology more or less in in the brain and much of their training is about of course medications and because they are medical doctors so they they have a better understanding of all this right that's what they're trained on um and so they can prescribe meds and of all the things i just mentioned only psychiatrists can prescribe medications as a psychologist i cannot even though i can be called a doctor i'm a different kind on the other white meat uh master's level nobody else can only them and there's nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. I'm not saying they're the only uh, medical uh, degree that can prescribe meds. I'm saying within um, within the field of psychology, they're the only ones. And that's why often, and they often, sometimes they do therapy, but a lot of times they do not. So that can be, uh, you know, I work with a lot of different psychiatrists and then I talk to them and I talk to the clients that the client feels cared for and taken care of. Um, but they're the ones who do all the meds and that kind of thing. So hopefully that really makes sense. I'm spending time on this because I think it's so important. In the same way that I would say a lot of times insurance companies will push you to their general, you know, the your your PCP or your primary care physician and say that that person should give you um, psychiatry meds, you know, like uh, medications for your depression or your anxiety. But those are general practitioners. And I think if you had cancer, you would not go to your general practitioner and, and get help. I think you would go to uh, an oncologist, to someone who specializes in cancer. Well, to me, mental health should not be thrown in the garbage with everything else, like with a broken leg that it is very important. It is, it should have a specialist that you're working with. And this is only because insurance, and I'm saying it insurance companies, because they didn't want to pay for psychiatrists. Psychiatrists cost them more. That is a more costly way to go. They can do it cheaper through a, a general, a PCP. And other countries don't have this the way Americans do, but I'm just throwing it out there in this way here in the United States. And I, and I, I, I'm not bashing. I, I'm really not. I'm trying to be just honest because you don't hear the stuff unless you're within the systems, you know, and I've worked within these systems for decades now. So you should go see a specialist. Now, if you already have medication that you know works and you just need someone to re-up the script and you don't, you know, sure, your, your PCP can fill that. Your primary care physician can fill that. But I would also say that you should at least be seen once a year, even if you're um, stabilized on your psychotropic medication, by a psychiatrist just to be followed, just to be checked, just to make sure, right? Just to make sure. Just like you would if you were on heart medication or something else, you wouldn't never go back to your to you know the the heart specialist right so i just want to do you love all that that was my long ooh, that was quite the soapbox but i'm i want you to understand what i'm talking about when i when i talk about this stuff so you understand what kind of doctor you're seeing or not seeing or what's the most helpful and not um and i've talked about emma sapala before on the podcast she's incredible love her work love her research and um is the name of that book happiness advantage happiness track happiness track i think it's the name of her book but she has a lot of research with um ptsd and vets and that kind of thing a lot of research around bre breath work and breathing and i'll link to a really wonderful harvard business review article she wrote um about ptsd symptoms and how breathing can positively can alleviate them basically uh, or much of them and in particular something called sky breathing which is i'm probably gonna say it wrong it's a it's a uh, uh, Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. I hope I said that well. So sorry to anyone listening who knows how to say that better. But it's called sky breathing. Again, it's a it's a type of um, cyclical controlled breathing. It's with it's got roots, of course, in traditional yoga, um, and uh, it's taught by a nonprofit called the Art of Living Foundation, and it's amazing. I I've done I I did it a few years ago. I want to do the training again, but I've sent tons of clients. You can do it online. Again, I wouldn't want this to be a substitute if you could be with a trauma person, but 
as an adjunct or if you really can't access something else, I, you know, uh, these are things to recommend for people that have a harder time. They're cheaper options. They do have live classes. I forget the cost of the class. I think it's a couple hundred dollars. Um, but again, I'll link to it and you can go check it out for yourself. And last but not least, I would say if you want to read more, there's, there's so much out there, but there is one seminal book on this topic that every single therapist worth their snuff has read at least a few times. I reread it before uh, re before do writing this out for you today and, and taking my notes. Um, and that is, it's a book called The Body Keeps the Score by uh, Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, he's a MD. The book came out years ago. It's been updated. It is kind of the, it's the, you know, it's, it's the Bible, the Quran, the Torah. It's, it is the, <laughs> the book uh, if you really want to read in one place about all of this with trauma and how it's held in the body and all that good stuff. So I would highly recommend that. And so all of those resources will be listed and on the website. Come on over, check it out, do some Google work if you need to. But I, I again, I, I want to highly recommend that true trained help is gotten if at all possible this is that serious and it shouldn't be minimized it shouldn't be you know swept away or under the rug uh you, it's really something to be addressed it can be healed it can be really transformed and i would love that for you Whew, so that is a heavy topic so if you've listened this far drink some water take care of yourself check in see if you're at all you know kind of feeling funky about all the information here um take some moment maybe take some notes or, or journal a little bit you know just really and you know I don't usually say that after podcasts but this is one of those this is one of those episodes that's a lot and again there's so much more information I just wanted to give a big broad brushstroke to help people get started on the path not to be a, a be all end all not to be all the answers but to be a place to begin because again it's not my specialty and I don't want to diminish the field in any way by pretending that I could be a specialist in this because I am not and there are much better people to do that work in the future I might try to get a specialist on the podcast uh, that could be fun right and talk to them um I will look into that maybe Dr. Vanderkolk Oh, who knows? Uh, I will look into that. And is he alive? Uh oh, I hope you are. Um, but you know, I love you. This is a lot. I really want you to take care of yourself. I want you to be thoughtful about this. I don't want you to be running out if you think it's your partner and say, "Oh, you got to listen to this thing." And oh my God, I'll no, no, no. <laughs> you know, take it slow. Take it easy. Think a little more about it. Really let this information integrate in a bit before you know, kind of taking it to the masses, so to speak. So. Uh, that's what I wish for you. And as always, you know, wow, I love that you hang out with me. Thank you for the honor of doing this podcast. I, oh, I love it so, so much. I cannot imagine my life without you. I really can't. I don't want to. Look, I'm going to start crying. You know me, I'll start to cry. Um, I really can't imagine doing this without you. So I can't imagine my life without you. I love having you here. I love doing this. I feel grateful and appreciative that I get to um, that I get to be a witness with you in your life and um, help hopefully guide in some helpful way. All right. Have an amazing, amazing, wonderful week, and I will talk to you real soon.